uh, yes, it's just me, I'm afraid. Uh, first of all, it was going to be Meg, um, and then it was going to be me and Kevin, but now you've just got me. <laughs> um, so thanks very much for inviting us along. Um, I'm Claire Cooper, and one of the new Cataran Echo Museum directors. Um, and I'm going to tell you the story of how the Echo Museum came about and how people who live and work locally have been involved along the way. First of all, though, how many of you have heard of Echo Museums? Yes! The biggest number um, in any room I've been in so far. Uh, but for the few of you who don't, uh, the idea originated in France in the 1970s. Uh, they focus on the identity of a place, with the term echo being a shortened um, form for ecology. Um, they're still a relatively new concept, with around 300 worldwide, and only one other fully in Scotland on Sky. I know that Flodden has some sites in Scotland as well as England. Um, they're set in specific landscapes and they offer a unique mechanism for community engagement with heritage, empowering people to manage their own heritage by taking an active role in preserving the objects, sites and cultural practices they value. A frame for a much more holistic interpretation of cultural heritage, quite different to the focus on specific items and objects that you usually get inside a building. Um, and very interestingly for me, an unusual focus for the development of sustainable cultural tourism. Um, the Cataran Echo Museum um, is set in the specific landscapes of Cataran country, um, a new description coined by our local tourism association for what an, on an ordinary map would be eastern Perthshire and western Angus. It stretches across four community council areas and covers 370 square miles from Ayrith and Blairgowrie down in the, in the south there, right up into the high Cairngorms. Um, it's around half an hour from Dundee and Perth, and those of you who know that part of Scotland will know how super excited we are about cultural tourism in that part of Scotland as a result of the VNA and all sorts of other things. Um, and the, the area also encapsulates the Cataran Trail, which you can see on that red dot, uh, one of Scotland's great long distance trails, um, and the Cairngorms National Park also, who did this map for us very kindly, and the new Snow Road scenic route that travels right through it. That's the, what was the old A93. This rural landscape is the result of over 6,000 years of people settling, farming and improving the landscape around them. And of course it contains, like many other parts of Scotland, a treasure trove of little known histories and heritage, um, as well as a very vibrant contemporary art scene. Um, there are Pictish stones, of course, to excite your curiosity, unknown stories from the legends of King Arthur. Anybody know about the Venora legend from there? Um, and also the Irish giant Finn McCool. There are more Finn McCool names in Glenshee than in any other part of Scotland, apparently. Uh, there are contemporary histories of the Scottish traveller community, um, important events linked to the great Jacobite rebellions. We all need a bit of that right now. Um, and fables of the Catarans themselves, the Highland clan warriors who came to be associated with cattle raiding. There's the amazing berry growing history and the textile mills of Blair Gowry, um, Ayleth's well preserved Old Town Centre, that's one of George Logan's photos if he's still here, um, and uh, the geology of the Highland Boundary Fault and the huge landscapes of Glenshee and Glen Isla, which of course have been sculpted by glaciation and traversed by old drove roads and ancient rights of way. Now, literally last month, uh, we just received grant funding from the European Leader Programme and the Drumdurg Wind Farm to launch a pilot phase of up to 15 sites and experiences within the footprint of the Echo Museum, which we're going to be designing over the next six months and which we aim to soft launch next year. Now, the idea for the Echo Museum came out of another project in the area that I've been co-producing with other local people called Cataran's Commonwealth. Our aim, and it's a continuing programme, is to deliver a multi-year programme of arts, culture and heritage events around Cataran country, which is focused on helping people celebrate and sustain our commonwealth, the things that belong to all of us. Now, many of you will know that the original phrase, the commonwealth or the commonweal, dates from the 15th century and comes from the old meaning of wealth, which is well-being. Today, it's used to define the things that belong to all of us. Some of these are bestowed to us by nature. Um, others are the product of cooperative human creativity. Some are entirely new, think of Wikipedia. Others are centuries old, like our language or our skills in managing the land or even our musical traditions. And each forms part of a dynamic combination of laws, relationships, values, cultures, and commitments, interdependencies that are present in all our communities which enable us to live and work. Now, more and more people are realising that with the marketisation of society in the West over the last three decades in particular, we've lost touch with this concept, and yet many of its assets play a vital role 
in helping to increase what some people call everyday democracy, public participation in the formal and informal institutions that shape our daily lives, um, and an awareness of what we need to do to reconnect um, if we're to flourish within the ecological limits of a finite planet. I don't know how many of you like Wendell Berry's work, but I think he puts it beautifully. A proper community is a commonwealth, a place, a resource, an economy, and it answers the needs, practical as well as social and spiritual, of its members, among them the need to need one another. Now, after four years of work and fundraising, we delivered a launch programme for Catarines Commonwealth last year, which involved three projects, very similar in ethos to what's been talked about today. The story box in Aleph Market Square was turned, um, uh, well, an old red telephone box was turned into a sound portal to the past and the future. Stories, songs and sounds about life in Aleph across history until the present day have been collected from archives and from older people living in the town now. Common Ground uh, used amazing aerial photography that the Heritage Trust um, did for us, uh, Perth and Kinross Heritage Trust, which I've shown a couple of slides of. Um, and also new place name research of the archaeology of the area as inspiration for a contemporary textile project. Um, Deirdre Nelson, who some of you may have heard of, she does a lot of work like this, work with local people of all ages to design and create new textiles for use in everyday settings from primary schools right through to our uh, local adventure centre. Um, and then the third, uh, this is very brief, it's all on the website, you can go and look it up more, um, which uh, I've got outside if anybody wants to pick up um, pamphlets about the story of the Cataran Trail and 100 Objects, which invited people who live and work around the trail and visitors to propose, to propose objects that they believe felt told an important part of the, the story of this part of Scotland. Um, this was turned into an exhibition which broke all box office records in Aleph Museum, which is very wee if any of you have been there, but still, uh, you know, sizeable. Um, and the point of telling you about these three projects is that they resulted in three things relevant to the development of the Echo Museum. So first of all, they created a significant new uh, set of arts, culture and heritage assets that enabled local people to see the riches on their doorstep. Secondly, and as importantly, they involved hundreds of people locally that generated a whole host of new relationships, as it always does. Um, and then combining this together created a new interest and a new energy to do more with the heritage of Catalan country uh, in order to benefit the area. And in a way, they fertilised the soil ready for the Echomuseum idea to take root and flourish. Now, serendipitously, as this was all happening, um, I was. this is a, an amazing archive we've got called the Lang Photographic Collection, which took photographs over three generations in the Strathmore and Blairgarry area all housed by Perth and Kinross Museum now, but it's just delightful, and this is one of my favourite photos from it. Um, uh, serendipitously, serendipitously, I was asked, as this was uh, being delivered, to speak at an agritourism conference in Italy. Um, not something I uh, is my world, but I'm on the leader local action group, and I was invited along. Um, and there I was introduced to the concept of echo museums, and I immediately thought, well, that's what we've got already in Catarine country. So I came back, started to talk about it to local people, tourism-related businesses, development trusts, history associations, um, all sorts of people right across the spectrum of our community, um, and including the kind of traditional uh, Perth and Kinross Heritage Trust type um, organisations as well, local councils, etc. And it was an idea that people connected to really quickly. And so very um, swiftly after all of those introductory conversations, I teamed up with Meg and Kevin, who are not here today, and we decided to get the ball rolling by constituting the Echo Museum as a social enterprise and getting cracking on the first phase of fundraising, which would su support this pilot phase that we're just starting now. So one of the attractions for us, this is another George photo, um, one of the attractions for us about Echo Museums is they offer an opportunity for local people to manage their own cultural and natural heritage, a complete antithesis to the top-down, certainly in my experience, generally city-based institution-led approach to delivering culture in rural areas that dominates how things get done today. Another is that the overheads are very low because they're generally not running buildings and huge teams of staff. Um, and in fact, we've created a mem and arts that spe specifically preclude us from owning fixed assets to make sure that we avoid this. Um, and the third um, is their focus on sustainability, which feels about the most important thing any of us could be focusing on right now, given the enormous challenges of climate change and resource scarcity that we all face. And I'm interested that that hasn't really come up so far today. Um, they also offer an opportunity to tell a different story about a place, uh, one that's a bit different from the Visit Scotland Castle's whisky, outlander and highland cow type narrative. 
Um, one that is about the lives of people who are perhaps at the bottom end of the food chain, for example. Um, I'm not a historian or a heritage specialist, but I've become riveted by the people who built the Caulfield military roads and the incredible hardship they faced. Um, or in the, uh, the people who worked in the old firm tunes and how they survived and adapted to the new technologies of their time, um, such as the industrial textile mills of Blair Gary or the mechanisation of farming in Strathmore. I think there are many, many stories from the past like that that are very relevant to the challenges that we're facing in terms of new technology adaptation and, and as I say, climate change and resource scarcity that we could take comfort from, perhaps. And most importantly, they offer an opportunity for people who live and work in a particular geography to build relationships with each other, which they might not ordinarily do. When I look at my own life as a result of both the Catarans Commonwealth Programme and the Echo Museum, I've met and learned about and become friends with so many different kinds of people doing so many different kinds of things, way more than I ever did in my previous, frankly, very narrow world of highly professionalised arts and culture. Um, and as a result, of course, I feel deeply connected now to where I live and work in a way that I've never felt before. Um, but developing and maintaining those relationships is a challenge. We started off co-creating the Echo Museum just this last month by holding a set of community consultations where we've been asking local people what they would like to see included, uh, what other opportunities there are, how they'd like to get involved, and indeed what concerns they have as well. And of course, there's heaps of ideas and feedback. Um, in terms of opportunities and concerns, we can already see that there could be a huge role for us to play in relation to joining people and organisations up with each other who should already be joined up but aren't. I'm sure all of you in the room are familiar with that one. But actually, how much of that can we take on board with our current tiny, very time-limited resource? Um, encouraging coordination and collaboration and trust is hugely and rightly time-consuming, uh, but we also need to be mindful that all of us involved in the nitty-gritty of this first phase have to earn a living elsewhere. Um, and I don't need to remind any of you, I'm sure, that funders don't generally recognise the time it takes to build community, uh, requiring you to deliver in relatively short time frames and absolutely, in the case of leader, not deviate from the course that you originally set out. We're also very mindful of our need to avoid the pitfalls and the su of success that, um, that might, and what that might bring us. So, for example, over-tourism is something that more and more people are talking about. It's happening on the North Coast 500, it's happening in Sky, it's happening in Venice, all sorts of places. We don't want to cause problems for others, and at the moment we don't have the resources to deal with any lack of infrastructure around particular sites that might get chosen, you know, whether that's parking or anything else, um, or indeed uh, something that many landowners have talked to us about, a kind of massive public education for city-based folk who may be insufficiently familiar with the outdoor access code. So how we manage expectations and yet still play a dynamic role in knitting together all the different relationships we'll need to make the Echo Museum a success is going to be a big focus for us in the next wee while. Um, and all of that will need to run alongside the work of actually building the digital and printed content around each of the um, sites that we want to promote in the first instance. Just before I finish, there's been a lot of talk about young people, uh, rightly so. Separately from this first set of five, 15 pilot sites, we're trying to raise a whole other bunch of money to get all our young people involved in launching the Echo Museum. Um, we've got some amazing ideas for installations around various sites. One of them, uh, it hopefully, will be a giant portrait of Hamish Henderson, the Scottish poet who was born in Blair Gary and grew up in Glenshee on the side of Spittle Hill. The Invercold estate have kindly given us permission. Um, heaven knows how we're going to do it, but next year is the 100th anniversary of his birth on the 11th of November 2019. Um, that's the end of my introduction to the Echo Museum. I hope it gives you a bit of a flavour about the short journey that we've been on just over a year from the idea being introduced to actually getting off the ground, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> um, and we're looking forward to uh, creating a place which, to paraphrase Proust, which I'm very fond of doing, um, <coughs> the real act of discovery consists not in finding new lands, but in seeing with new eyes. And we hope that that's what the Catalan Echo Museum will do. And we look forward to welcoming you in 2019. Thank you.